So some people experience such a profound change in their life that they go to the extreme of changing their names. So here's a little quiz for you. The famous boxer Muhammad Ali floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. What was his name originally? Some of you are saying Cassius Clay, right, right, you got that. Here's another test. Tall, long-armed basketball player named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. What was the name his parents gave him? Lou Alcindor, the older ones knew it that. What about even older than that? When the apostle Peter became a follower of Jesus, his name was changed from what? Simon, and the Apostle Paul, you probably know, before he was a follower of Jesus and experienced a life change transformation, he was, he was called Saul. Then I, I know a personal friend of mine who, who, because of a profound spiritual experience in her life, went from being Shirley, where she had been all her life, to choosing the name Jordan as in crossing the Jordan River and making a profound switch. And what I'm excited about in this series. It's called Resurrect, and we're going to be looking at what does it mean, the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to us. And I hope that the goal as we walk away from this whole series will be that you understand that becoming a follower of Jesus, getting saved, uh, accepting Christ, whatever term we use for that, that incredible transition, is not just like joining a team or choosing some intellectual beliefs to agree with, or, or it's not even just like saying, I, I'm going to make this choice. That there is an incredible miracle that happens when we choose to follow Jesus. And the Bible says that we died and we came alive again in Christ. And so we, in fact, are resurrected beings if you're a follower of Jesus. And so the prototype that we are going to look at in the New Testament is Lazarus. And I want you to see as we walk through this story of Lazarus that you and I have an awful lot in common if we have come to believe in Jesus and that we are like Lazarus, we have been resurrected. So let's go back and look a little bit at this story. And uh, it's found in John chapter 10 and 11, 12. And uh, I'm going to review some of it and read some of it for us. So let's look at this very basic fact. What is Lazarus known for? <laughs> As far as I know, we have no recorded words of his. We don't really know, except that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were siblings, two sisters and a brother, and they lived together in a little town called Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. And we have words from Mary and Martha. We don't know that Lazarus said anything in the scriptures, but he's known for one thing. He was raised from the dead. And so I want to talk a little bit about how that must have been experiencing how much, how Martha and Mary must have experienced that, but also just a little backstory. Jesus in the beginning of chapter 11, it says that he had, he's come right to the end of his ministry. So he's just literally a week or two away from crucifixion and the opposition has already decided that they want to kill him. And so he's retreated from the area of Jerusalem, the kind of the hotbed there. And he's, he's gone away to the other side of the Jordan river. And and he says to his disciples, or he gets word from, from Mary and Martha, that Lazarus is sick. And they're like, okay, if he's sick, he's going to recover. And, and he said, no, th this is more serious than that. And so he tells them clearly, he says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. He's already knowing clearly that this is a plan that God has. And and in the incredible uh, idea of this passage, he gets word that his dear friend, and, and the Bible's clear that Mary and Martha and Lazarus had almost like a family relationship with Jesus, that, that when he came down to the Jerusalem area, he stayed at their house, which was in Bethany, and, and they talked to him like he's a brother. They talked to him like, like he's part of their family. And so we know that, that Jesus loved them dearly. And so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, and he even understood that the sickness was not going to end in death, but it was really so that God's power was going to be displayed through Jesus. It says, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, verse 6, he stayed there two more days. Now, when you're reading that along, it's like, what? I mean, 
if, if he was going to go, and, and then it says, let's go back to Jerusalem. But if he was going to go, why didn't he go immediately? As soon as he heard, if you care about somebody, why didn't you just get up and take, take care of that situation? Obviously, Jesus has the power to do it. And in fact, that, that story is going to come, you know, we're going to find out later in the story, some of the reasons. But I think clearly, it's because Jesus is very intentionally walking a path to make a point. Death in those days was far more personal than it is now. I don't mean that they felt losses any more deeply than we do, but when somebody dies here, we, we call for the medical examiner or we call for the funeral home to come and they take the body and, and it goes away. And then we don't, we don't see them until they're all beautifully dressed and in a coffin or if they're cremated, we don't perhaps even see them again. And it's all done somewhere else. But in this culture, when somebody died, it's hot weather, it's dry, dry land, and they didn't have any embalming methods for common people. And so the family, friends got involved. And when somebody died, they took the body and, and put it in the middle of the room and washed the body and put spices on the body and then wrapped them in clothes, in cloths, like long strips of, of cloths. And, and then they would take it after a time of mourning and they, they would take it and they would put it inside, uh, usually in, in Israel at this time, in some kind of a stone enclosure, a cave or a carved uh, place, just as Jesus was laid. And then they would roll a stone in front of it because obviously the, the process of the decay of a body in a, in a warm climate was very rapid and, and there was going to be some real problems. And that comes out in this story as well. And I was in Cambodia recently visiting our missionaries there, and, and we had a chance to visit a funeral. And uh, it was the pastor of one of the local churches, but his whole family are not believers. He's the only believer in that family. And so this was a, a pagan funeral. And what happened is they actually have this tradition where they have a, a log that they hollow out and they put the body in that log. And it is in right in the middle then of a large party that lasts for three to five days and people are sitting around and they're burning incense to the spirits and they're talking and mourning. And, and literally the, the log is then sealed up with caulking around it. And there's wires that are put over because that body is decaying right there. And, and to us, it seems kind of shocking that, that they just put things on top of it and they sit right there and, and they visit all around it. And it, it almost seems like it's not very respectful, but that's their cultural process. And I, I thought as I saw that, they experienced death very much like they did in Jesus' day. It's very up close and personal, and, and they're aware of all of the process. And so that, that leads us to understand something really important about Lazarus and his resurrection, is that he was really dead, um, the family had taken care of the body. They had put him in the tomb. And Jesus had delayed two days. Now, when he gets there, we find out that Lazarus is four days dead. So if Jesus had hurried right away, he would have been at least dead for two days. And maybe you think there's not much difference between two days and four days. But I think in, a, in an understanding of the miracle that Jesus was going to, is going to accomplish... He didn't want any doubt. Lazarus was really dead. This wasn't a matter of he kind of fainted or they mistook it, that, that he really didn't die. No, he, he was dead. And in fact, later in the story, it says, Jesus deeply moved, came to the tomb, and it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. You see, they were very, very clear that he was very dead, which makes it all the more amazing that he was absolutely made alive. This is important for you and I to understand that the miracle that Jesus did, that when Jesus came after four days, he comes and first Martha runs out to meet him. And she's like, so upset. And she's like, Jesus, why didn't you come? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So she's showing a lot of faith. She knew that Jesus was powerful and, and she knew she'd seen him heal the blind and lepers. And, and she was absolutely sure that if Jesus had come, Lazarus would still be alive. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she mistook, mistook his statement of thinking, 
I know at the last day there'll be a resurrection and we'll see him someday. And, and she took that understanding, showing that she had real theology. She understood who Jesus was. She understood that there was a resurrection the last day. And I guess it's important, especially in light of having just come through the book of Ruth, to acknowledge the fact that, that having a good relationship with God and having good understanding of the truth does not take all the pain away from loss. Uh, when we lose somebody, it still hurts. And, and even in the, in the case of Mary and Martha, they loved Jesus and they knew what he could do, but man, it hurts to lose their brother. And so they were kind of reproaching Jesus, like, why weren't you here? And so Jesus makes this incredible statement to her. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even when they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asked her, do you believe this? I don't think there's any way she could fully understand what he was saying, but she said, I know that you are the son of God. I know that whatever God asks or whatever you ask of God will be accomplished. So yeah, I do know that kind of, but I don't know it like you want me to understand it. And so Jesus then has a conversation with Mary and there's a beautiful verse there right in the middle. Jesus was crystal clear even from the beginning. He said, Lazarus sickness is going to result in the glory of God. He knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. And yet in the middle of that, there's the shortest verse in the Bible. John eleven thirty five 35 said, Jesus wept. And what that means is that he looked around and he saw all the destruction and all the pain and that they were feeling because of Lazarus' death. And I think he looked and he thought all of the mess that has come of the creation that he had made and that sin has destroyed and that the death has such power and causes agony. I think that's such an important picture of God that first of all, that the reason he stayed two more days was because God had a bigger plan than Mary and Martha could see. But the reason he wept was because of their pain. He didn't have his plan in a, in a kind of a cold calculating kind of way. He, he knew what he needed to do for God's greater glory, for lifting up praise and honor to, to make God more famous. But he also knew that it really hurt. And I love that picture of Jesus in the middle of this powerful miracle. The tears are coming down his face and he says, I care and I know and I feel it with you. And I think he was agonizing for the loss of all of creation, for the loss of everyone. And so he goes over and he asks him where the, the tomb is and they take him to the tomb. And he said, okay, take away the stone. And of course, Martha objects because it's going to smell. And Jesus says, do it anyway. And then there's this moment and try to imagine what it would have been like to be there, to, to see the stone being rolled away and wonder what in the world Jesus was going to do. And when he had said this, it says, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. My, my father always told the story saying he had to say Lazarus, otherwise all the dead people in the whole cemetery might have come out because that's the kind of power that Jesus has. He said, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. Now, now just pause there for a minute. Think about what this means. So here's a body. A human body starts decaying rapidly, especially in warm weather without any embalming. And, and all of the cells had begun to disintegrate and the blood had coagulated. I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but this body was a total mess. I mean, can you imagine the, the recreation, the rehealing, the repairing that had to be done for that body to come alive? You see, this is, this is almost like a, a pre, a warm-up act for the resurrection of Jesus. And you need to understand how amazing it is. He said, Lazarus, come out. And everybody's eyes are focused on this empty door, looking at this dark tomb. And all of a sudden there's rustling in there and moving about. And can you imagine their eyes are just like big as dinner plates? And, and then they they see him and he comes out and he's all wrapped around. And you think about how that must have felt. They're looking at him and he's got these grave clothes wrapped around him and wrapped around his face and wrapped around his feet. And he, and he shuffles and stumbles out. And everybody is 
just amazed and I think paralyzed. I think, I think he's trying to stumble out the door and, and everybody's just like, I cannot believe this is true to the degree that Jesus has to say, Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> um, you guys, this, this guy needs some help. He's alive and yet he's trussed up like he's dead. And so they rushed over to, to take him free. And to, and to set him free. And so Lazarus, without speaking a word that we know of, has gone from the, the object of grief to the object of incredible wonder at what God has done. And you'd think, man, the rest of his life must have been awesome. I, I don't know. I think the only disappointed person at this scene was Lazarus himself. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't know if he was all the way to heaven or if God had him in a waiting room or what, but it's like he's like, oh, I'm back here. I'm back to earth again. But you know what? It's interesting is that his, the miracle that Jesus did for him, which took no power of his own, but was all done by God, it turned him out to be a polarizing person. Now, maybe that's not a word you think of. We have polarized sunglasses, but a polarizing person means that when they come into a situation, they press people to the right or to the left. That there's no like easy middle ground. There's this, this incredibly different response to that person. And in his case, you can see what happened is some people heard about this and they came out of great curiosity and interest to find out more about Jesus. John chapter 12 says it. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there at Bethany, and they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. This was like big news all over Jerusalem. Did you hear there's a dead man that's now walking around alive? I mean, he was four days dead, and they would tell the story in detail. And so people would say, well, I've heard Jesus, but I have never seen a dead person walking around. And so then further in the chapter, it says, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. So they go all and tell their family and friends and many people because they had heard that he had performed this sign went out to meet him. So they are attracted to Jesus because of the fact that Lazarus has had a life change that's incredible. Now Lazarus doesn't change his name. <laughs> he does something better. The word Lazarus is changed forever. When you talk about the story of Lazarus, people think somebody who was raised from the dead. And so then a little later in the chapter, it's an even more amazing impact. It says, at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. So even those scribes and Pharisees that had been part of the, the cadre of people who had planned on not only resisting Jesus' work, but eventually they had plotted to kill him. Now they're saying, some of them, this was the final straw. It's like, man, we can't deny it anymore. We've got to believe this is the truth. And it says they came to believe in him. But there's this little caveat here that I think is important for you and I. It says, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. I think the, the juxtaposition of those two words together they had a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. They had come to believe who he was. So inside they had come to believe, but outside they wouldn't acknowledge it because of fear. I think, frankly, that's something that, that really impacts a lot of us, that we would speak more openly about our faith in Christ, that we would let people know that we're a follower, that, that we might invite them to church, that we, that we might be more active in our faith if it weren't for the fear. I'm afraid of what they're going to say. I'm afraid of what they're going to think of me. And, and we don't live in a culture where we're getting outright persecution. Maybe they just take you off their Christmas party list. But that fear, I think that controls many of us. And, and there's another line here that's really impactful. It says, the next line is, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. So not only were they being controlled by their fear, he says there's a deeper problem there. They were more interested in people admiring than they were that God be pleased with their response. So I want to ask you that question. 
they're kind of covert Christians. They're, they're Christians on the inside, but they've disguised it on the outside. And I want to ask you that question as you think about the circle around you, the people at your school, at your work, people in your family. Do they know that you're a follower of Jesus? Have they seen a life change in you? You see, people who change their name, whatever the reason is, they're saying, this change I want everybody to know. I am a new person and I believe a new thing and I don't care who knows. And I think there's a lot of Christians that are living in fear. They don't want to acknowledge Jesus because they're not ashamed of Jesus, but they're afraid for their own for their own comfort. They're afraid for some awkwardness that might come. And they're also afraid of what did happen to Lazarus. He's a polarizing person. Some came and were drawn to Jesus and you say, oh, that would be wonderful. But some saw him and they plotted. This is so important that some people saw exactly the same evidence. They were there. Maybe they were even watching Lazarus walk out of the tomb. And so it says, so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. <laughs> Can you believe how hard their hearts were? They said, we can't deny the miracle. <laughs> Lazarus is just walking around. Everywhere he goes, he's a walking billboard that Jesus is real. And they said, we can't let that happen. Not only do we have to kill Jesus, we have to kill Lazarus. What did Lazarus do? He had done nothing to them except he was a, a prime example of the fact that Jesus did miracles. So what does that relate to us? How does that change our world? Well, the Bible uses those same terms to talk about what does it mean when we have come to follow Jesus. You see, the, the scribes and the Pharisees who didn't want to believe it wasn't that they didn't have any evidence. You know, people often come and they say, well, if I could just see a miracle or if I had been there walking around with Jesus, I would believe. And that's not true. They didn't believe because they didn't want to believe. They didn't want to surrender to Jesus. They didn't want, they wanted to be their own God, frankly. But the Bible says when we come to the end of that, when we come to believe that Jesus really is the Christ, when we, we come to pray that prayer that says, Father, I surrender and I give my life to you and I, I trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins and, and I accept the gift of eternal life. When that happens, it's not just how you feel. The Bible says, whether you feel it or not, this incredible transaction goes on. And Colossians 3 is one of the places that mentions it. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. He said, you know what really happened to you when you decided to follow Jesus? It wasn't just that you joined the church, got on a new team, changed some of your behaviors, tried to use different language. It wasn't just that you made a choice like you're choosing a club. No, he said, whether you know it or not, something far more miraculous happened to you. That just like the decaying and dead body of Lazarus, that there was a miracle involved to make him a walking around fully alive person. And the Bible says it's that exact same kind of miracle that happens when our lives are transformed in Christ. That we die to the old person. We die to our old self and we come alive in Christ. And in fact, when we baptize somebody, we use a phrase from Romans chapter 6 that says, buried with him in the likeness of his death. And that's putting him under the water is like a picture of death. Raised to live a new life. And there's a lot of complex thinking that has to go in that. You have to get that understanding correct. And next week, we're going to be spending some time in Romans chapter 6. And maybe you want to read that ahead of time as we talk about what does it mean that we have been resurrected with Christ. But right here, he says, you have been raised with Christ for you died. And the rest of the chapter basically goes on to say, now you need to learn to live like that. And he walks through that same process of what it means to have Christ raise us from the dead. And in fact, it's more amazing than that. 
the spirit of Christ actually comes and lives inside of us and begins to live his life through us. And I know that's a very, you know, complex idea, but it's very, very important. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But what happens when that happens, when we're a walking around billboard for advertising the, the life of Jesus and what he can do in us, then some people are going to be attracted. Some people are going to say, I'm not sure what's happened to you, but I'd like to know more. I have a good friend who's been a follower of Jesus for about 20 years, and, and he has got a a wonderful way of just loving people. And he's been going to the same coffee shop for quite a while and, and has made some acquaintances, some friends there as he just comes and picks up his coffee. And a couple of weeks ago, the manager said to him, you know, I'd like to have coffee with you some point. And my friend is like, sure, okay. He says, I'd like to talk to you more about your faith. Wow. And when they finally got together, his opening line was, you seem to be somebody that takes your faith seriously. I'd like to know more about that. Isn't that amazing? Now, not many of us will have that obvious an experience, but let me tell you, more people are watching your life than you know, particularly those who knew you before you came to Christ and, and have been watching the transition and the change and the life that, that Christ has in us. And some will say, I want some of that. Tell me about that. But the same thing, that happened with Lazarus may happen to you and me. Part of the reason we have some fear about this is because it's possible. Some people will reject you because they have rejected Christ. And I'm not talking about being offensive with your witness. I'm not talking about being a jerk and, and, and telling, Jesus, telling about Jesus in a way that's just, you know, kind of insensitive. I'm talking about the fact that no matter how much you love people and serve them and tell about Jesus in a, in a compelling and gentle way, some people don't want to believe and you are an irritant. I am an irritant. And so they, they may repel, they may push off from us. And some of that is painful. Some of that's difficult when people quit talking to you or when people pull away from you because, because you've been evidencing the life of Christ. And Jesus exactly promised that would happen. That everybody who wants to follow Jesus, if they rejected Jesus, they will probably reject us. And that's a part of the cost that it is to be a follower of Jesus. And you know what? When it happened to the apostles, it says that they rejoiced that they had been given the honor to suffer for Jesus. I don't think we have very much of that mindset, but I think we need a lot more of it. I think Christians are going to be more and more outsiders in our culture and perhaps even persecuted at some level. And we need to be ready to say, this is who I am. And some will be attracted and some will be repelled. And that's okay. Second Corinthians 2 says it like this. For we are an aroma of Christ. That because Christ has changed us, there is a, a, a smell about us, a, a, an aroma of our life. And he said to some, it's an aroma of life because they also want to follow Jesus. And to some, it's an aroma of death. And that's what it means to really smell like Jesus, to be like Jesus. I want to challenge you with a couple of thoughts on a transformational moment here. It's not on your outline, but I want you just to Sit and think about these two questions for just a moment. First is, have I been resurrected with Jesus? There's a lot of people who get conformed to a church, who learn the right words, maybe even who pray the prayer or get baptized. But I want to ask you just privately, when I start talking about somebody who's a follower of Jesus, do you say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus. I know that. I, I still fail and I still sin but I know that I am a follower of Jesus. And if you don't, I'd love to talk to you or even in the quietness of this moment, you can just pray and say, Jesus, take over my life. I surrender to you. The second question is, if you're a follower of Jesus, are you still <laughs> undering a, are you still in a, in a covert kind of situation where you're hiding it? Are you a believer on the inside and fake it on the outside? And I'm not asking you to change your name or, or to make some great splash like that. 
But you know, I think some of why putting a bumper sticker on your car or putting a, a yard sign, I think part of why that's hard for some people is because they don't want their neighbors to know that they're, they're followers of Jesus. And I think it's going to be more and more obvious who really follows Jesus and who doesn't. And I invite you to be part of that group who are Lazarus people, who are making a positive aroma in the world of Jesus so that some might come to hear. I'm going to hand off to the campuses to walk through the last missional moment. Thanks for listening. So we're so glad you've joined us online. And if you've got the uh, outline online or if you have a paper copy, um, we have a missional moment also. And this is something we're doing weekly is we want to focus your attention, first of all, on this blessed strategy that starts begin with prayer. And I, I've encouraged you to think about three or four people in your life that are not yet followers of Jesus. And it may be family members or people that are in your sphere of influence. And, and I want to encourage you to think more specifically. So at the campuses, we actually are handing out a little uh, square that has just four lines on it. And it's a simple way to just write down four people's names, people that are in your life that you care about, that maybe Jesus is trying to reach to through you. And so part of that is to begin to pray for them by name every day. And so if you don't have one of these cards, just take a piece of paper, um, just put four lines on it, and put four names there. And I want you to just make it small enough so that you can put it in your wallet or put it on the, the dash of your car or put it somewhere where you see it regularly so that it can remind you, I need to pray for these people. Because prayer not only changes other people's hearts, prayer changes my heart. When I'm praying for people who are not believers, I'm more aware of how I can be an influence in their life. So this is an important moment for us to say, Let's not just pray for lost people in general. Let's pray specifically for three or four people that God would put on your heart. Let me close our time in prayer. God, thank you for the story of Lazarus and, and be, not because of his own goodness or certainly not because of his many words. He became a symbol of your power because you raised him from the dead. And Father, you've done that same thing for us. And God, we love you and are so appreciative of it. Thank you for giving us eternal life when we were so dead. And we also ask that you would use us to bring your life to somebody else. And God, for these people that we put on our card, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. And if we can get to be a part of that by loving them, by, by being open about our faith, by not living in fear, then God, we, we sign up for that. We want to be Lazarus people. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.